Tonight's topic is going to be, who is Jesus? I, again, I am Mary Jo Sharp, uh, the founder of Confident Christianity, a Christian apologetics website and nonprofit ministry. Um, I have the privilege of being the debate monitor tonight. I want to say thank you again to Jackson Memorial Baptist Church for having these events here. Thank you very much for hosting us. You guys have done a wonderful job. We very much appreciate that. Tonight, our apologists, <laughs> as I said earlier, the epic battle of the Qureshis, include, first of all, Muslim apologist Farhan Qureshi. Farhan is a former, um, let me see if I get this right, Ahmadiyya, Ahmadiyya. Uh, who converted to Islam at the age of 17 and has since dedicated himself to defending Islam. He can be found at www.defendingislam.com. For our Christian apologist, you're going to have to go with me on his introduction. Nabil Qureshi has a Master of Arts in Basket Weaving from the University of Warungi, Kenya. His favorite activities include shopping at Macy's and reading Gary Smalley's self-help books. Nabil's sign is Aries, and he is experienced in frisbee golf. His website is www.chucknorris is my number one fan. Okay, Christian apologist Nabil, that was a dare by the way. Christian apologist Nabil Qureshi. He is co-founder of Acts 17 Apologetics Ministry. He has a Master of Arts in Christian Apologetics from Biola University and is about to graduate with his medical doctorate from Eastern Virginia Medical School. Quite different. <laughs> He's an experienced speaker and debater. His website can be found at www.acts17.net. Tonight's topic, Who Was Jesus? The man Jesus, according to the followers of Christianity, did not only claim to be God, but in fact was God himself in the flesh. The deity of Christ is an essential belief to the Christian faith. In Paul's writing to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, he states, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. A skeptic of Christ's deity may say that Jesus was not God, but an esteemed teacher or prophet of God. Today's debate will explore the deity of Jesus Christ. Was he a man or God? The format will be the first, oh, the format will be 30 minute of um, opening statements, 15 minute first rebuttals, 10 minute second rebuttals. Are we doing crossfire? Okay, we're doing cr uh, four sessions of two minute crossfires each and five minute concluding statements. Some final remarks, please turn off your cell phones or put you, them on the vibrate setting. And also, uh, as I said earlier, the issues that we deal with in these debates are always very sensitive material. So please, to be respectful to both of our debaters, do not give any statements or comments during the debate. Please withhold any of that. All right, and out of respect, not just for the debaters, but for our host church as well. Okay, so we are now ready to begin. And we are starting with Nabil Qureshi's Opening statement. <laughs> well, I gotta say, that's the last time I triple dog dare Mary Jo do anything. She actually did it. Okay. Uh, I would like to first start off by saying thank you very much for having me here at Jackson Memorial Baptist Church. I absolutely love coming back every single time. Everyone's so welcoming. Um, and speaking of welcoming, I would like everyone to welcome back my wife, who's back from her deployment. She just came back today, and so I now have uh, the official word, my hair is too long. Um, take care of that. Uh, 
On my right is Farhan Quraish, you know. I have to stay right off the bat. Farhan is uh, one of the coolest guys I know. Um, he and I will talk on the phone every now and then. He's not related to me, the Quraish is pure coincidence. Um, he's not related to me, but he will, he's been in touch with my parents, so he'll talk to them every now and then. I know his extended family. So we know each other, and we've discussed these things many times. Uh, we've met in public forums before to debate in the past, in August of 2006, we debated this very issue. Uh, so we talk all the time, he's a good friend of mine, and the reason why I really like uh, debating Farhan is because I, I can deal with his ideas uh, right here on stage. And um, I do believe uh, that someone with his level of integrity, his level of honesty and sincerity, uh, will come to know Jesus Christ in the near future. And that's why I really appreciate debating him. So let's start off. I actually used to believe the same things that Farhan used to believe before he became an Orthodox Sunni Muslim. Um, I used to believe that Jesus was not God, and I stand here before you now believing that Jesus certainly claimed to be divine and in fact was the risen Lord. The argument that I'll be using today to prove this is that historically Jesus' statements concerning his own identity revealed his claim to be God. So first and foremost, we're going to see what Jesus' own claims say. Then we're going to talk about the earliest stratum or the earliest layer of Christian history and see that it shows Jesus being equated with Yahweh and honored. As Yahweh. So right off the bat, after Jesus died, uh, people were calling him Yahweh um, in, in his attributes and honoring him that way. Finally, any other position either disregards evidence or is based off of inferior reasoning. And Farhan does have a different position, and as we hope to explore today, uh, we'll see that it is of uh, either lesser evidence or reasoning. First, I'd like to mention that the New Testament will be the source of a lot of my information today, but I am not using it as the inspired Word of God. Now, I certainly believe the New Testament is the inspired Word of God. I believe it is the inerrant Word of God. However, if you approach someone who does not believe these things in a public forum, uh, it's not appropriate to use it as the inspired, inerrant Word of God. But what everyone will agree with, uh, scholars and lay people alike, should agree with the fact that the New Testament contains writings concerning Christianity that are by far the earliest, historically speaking. Things come later that say different things, but the earliest scriptures at all uh, regarding Christianity that we have in our presence are found in the New Testament. And if they're early, that makes them reliable. So we're going to first start off by seeing the case for Jesus' deity from his own um, time, while he was still alive here. What did he say? What did he do? Uh, what were the things that others did about Jesus? And what were the things that others said about Jesus? If you look at Jesus' life from any of these four angles, you will see that it makes most sense to say that Jesus claimed to be divine. Can everyone see this, by the way? Am I in the way? Good? Good. It's the hair. It's too long. <laughs> now, when someone asked me, and as Farhan has recently said in one of his recent debates uh, with the scholar James White, he says... Where did Jesus say, I am God? It's absolutely crucial that something like the concept of Godhood should be something that's delineated very clearly. If the concept of who is God is not delineated clearly in your theology, then you have a problem. I do think that Jesus very clearly stated that he was God. The time he did so was when he was uh, in front of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a Jewish ruling council, and up until this point in time, the Jews had mostly suffered Jesus to do whatever he wanted to do and say whatever he wanted to say without reproach. At this point, however, they're calling him by the living God, saying, we charge you by the living God, who are you? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? So at this point in time, we see the Jews saying to Jesus, who are you? Tell us now. Jesus responds by saying, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, this is Jesus' statement. To us, it might seem kind of cryptic, but I guarantee you that was not the case with the Sanhedrin. Jesus started off his response by using the words, I am. Now, I am might seem like a, a response to the question, who are you, or the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One, and in that context, it may very well be. However, throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, Jesus has been using the words, I am, in a very strange way. Let's take a look. Jesus says, for example, in John 8, 24, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. He also says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know I am. Oh, I am what? The sentence is incomplete. There's an antecedent that is entirely missing. I, I, am, I am Jesus. I am your friend. I am the Son of God. What is the I am that's being said there? Well, we know, historically speaking, that the I am statement is not something that Jesus made for himself the very first time. 
In fact, we see it very clearly used in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses is approaching God, and he says, Now they shall say to me, speaking about the Hebrews, What is his name, uh, that, the name of God? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. So when Jesus is saying the words, I am, in front of the Sanhedrin, as well as in front of uh, the Jews in John chapter 8, we see that he's saying it in a very strange way, and that's because God himself used these words, I am, to proclaim his own deity throughout the Old Testament. We see it first and foremost here in the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Then we see it repeatedly in books such as Isaiah, constantly over and over. In Isaiah 43, for example, God says, I am, I am. And in doing so, he's expounding his divine sovereignty um, and his divine everlasting nature. He's not using words such as I was or I will be. He says, I am, and he's eternally applying this. In Jesus when he reveals himself to the Sanhedrin, starts off by using the words, I am, much like God did in the Old Testament. By the way, Jesus says this not just in front of the Sanhedrin uh, in, in the book of Mark. He also says it in the book of Matthew when he's talking about walking on water. He says to the, to the disciples, um, take courage, I am. Now, our translations might say, do not be worried, it is me. But in actuality, if you read the Greek, it just says, take courage, I am. And it is a clear uh, parallel to a verse from the Old Testament when God is passing on the waters and saying, have no fear, for I am with you. But there's one that's just completely undeniable. When Jesus is in front of the Jews in John chapter 8, verse 58, the Jews have said to him, you yourself are not yet 50 years old, yet you claim to have seen Abraham. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born... I am. Well, what could this possibly mean? The charge being alleged against him is that he's claiming to have seen with his eyes Abraham. Jesus does not respond by saying, I didn't see him. Jesus does not respond by saying, I'm speaking figuratively. Jesus responds by saying, yes, I'm telling you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I was? No, 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 no. Before Abraham was born, I am. I eternally existed then as I eternally exist now. This claim is undeniable. We see at the very beginning of Mark chapter 14, verse 62, that he responds by saying, I am, but his claim has just begun. As you see right after that, he says, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now the Son of Man, he calls himself the Son of Man more than anything else in the four Gospels. His preferred title for himself is the Son of Man, and rarely do we find these words on anyone else's lips. Well, what does Son of Man mean? Well, in the Old Testament, we see someone, Ezekiel, using the term son of man for himself. But in those contexts, whenever Ezekiel used son of man, he meant to say, I am nothing more than dust, nothing more than a son of man. He was using the word son of man to portray his low nature. However, this is not at all how Jesus uses the word son of man. Look, for example, in, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The son of man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. Now here, Jesus is saying the Son of Man has angels. He says, keep alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to stand before the Son of Man. Now you need to pray in order to stand before this Son of Man, in order to have the strength to stand before the Son of Man. And Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Wow, this Son of Man that Jesus is claiming to be comes in his own glory, just like God has his own glory. Uh, the God the Father, the Son of Man, comes in His own glory, and all the angels come with Him, and then He sits on His own glorious throne. The reason why Jesus is using terms such as these to describe the Son of Man, very different from Ezekiel, is because He is using the term to relate back to a very specific event in the Old Testament, and that is a vision that Daniel had. You see this vision in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, where Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, the Son of Man, to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, in this, in this statement from the Old Testament, what do we have? Daniel's looking and he's seeing the Ancient of Days. He's seeing God the Father on his own throne. And then he sees one who looks like a son of man approaching the Father. And this one who looks like a son of man is given dominion, kingdom, 
which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Not only this, but it is said that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Now let's take a step back. Daniel is seeing the Father in heaven, and then he's seeing another man approach the Father who is given dominion. He's given the kingdom. It will not be destroyed. His uh, rulership over it will not pass away. And people of every nation and men of angry, every language might serve him. And this word serve is used just over 130 times in the Bible. And each time this word serve is used, I'm speaking about the Hebrew and the, the Greek, each time this word serve is used, it is used only to denote a service due to God. And yet Jesus is claiming the service for himself. By putting him as the son of man of this passage, he is saying that people of every nation and tongue and language will serve him. So let's look at this. Jesus is saying all peoples, nations, and men of every language will serve Jesus forever. A service reserved for God in Jesus' own kingdom where Jesus will have dominion throughout eternity. What kind of man, normal man, can say these things about himself? Let alone say them about his position in heaven. No normal man can claim to have dominion over heaven forever and have people worshiping him in heaven forever. Clearly, Jesus is not just claiming to be a prophet. So we see when Jesus says, Son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, he's using a direct quotation from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. But also there's a little bit more to this statement. He says he's sitting at the right hand of the power. Now, this is a clear reference to Psalm 110, verse 1, where it is said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It is well known that no one in the Jewish milieu could approach God and sit in God's presence. Not at all. What happened in the Jewish times was that people wouldn't even enter into the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was the inner room of the temple in Jerusalem. Only one person could ever enter that room because it was said God lived there. Only one person could enter into that room, and that was the chief priest of all the Jews. And that person could only enter once per year. And while entering in that room once per year, he had to follow certain regulations and certain rules. If he were not to do so, he would be struck dead. No way ever would he sit down in that room. There's no way ever that he would claim to have the opportunity to live in that room, but that's what Jesus is claiming for himself. He's claiming the ability to sit down at the right hand of the power. Basically, he's saying, I have the right to live next to God. And in the Jewish context, that was, according to Daryl Bach, tantamount to claiming to be God. So in this one verse, in Mark chapter 14, verse 62, what we see is when Jesus is finally asked, who are you? Charged by the chief priest, his response is, I am, as in the God of Moses, from Exodus chapter 3. He responds by saying, and you will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, as in the God of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13. Sitting at the right hand of the power, as in the God of David, Psalm 110, verse 1. And what do the Jews do? What do the Jews do? They pick up stones to stone him. I'm sorry, they, they, they say that they're going to crucify him. Jesus, at this time, has said so clearly that he is God, that the chief priest rips apart his clothing and says, we have no other need to try this man. He has just committed the blasphemy before you. And what was that blasphemy? Claiming to be God. This wasn't the only time he did these kinds of things. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 6 through 8, Jesus calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. Now, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. What man can go around calling himself Lord of the Ten Commandments? No man can do that. Only God can. In the same way, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, who claims to be the gatekeeper to God? No one can claim to be the gatekeeper to God. But Jesus himself says he is the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father but through him. Beyond this, he says he gives life in John chapter 5. He says he answers prayers in John chapter 14. And he says he will judge mankind for the sake of his own glory, so that he may be honored by everyone with the honor due to the Father. Now I ask you, what man can say, honor me as you honor God? Either a man who's claiming to be God incorrectly, or a man who's claiming to be God correctly. But there is no doubt about it, he was claiming to be God. 
So we've seen so far the things that Jesus said which show that he claimed to be God, but then there were things that he did as well. For one, he forgave sins, and two, he performed miracles in his own name. To see that he forgave sins, we can look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 2 through 3, and this is illustrated as well in Mark chapter 2 as well as in the book of Luke. They brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. This is how we know Jesus was funny. Here's a paralytic coming to Jesus, and instead of healing him, Jesus first says, Your sins are forgiven. Then everyone says, How can you forgive people his, uh, how can you forgive this man his sin? And he shows, Well, anyone can just say something. And then he heals him. But keep in mind, what he did was forgive him his sins. And when he forgave the person his sins, the reaction that was received from the Jews was, This fellow blasphemes. Because no one can forgive sins, no one has that authority except the one who is sinned against, God himself. Not only that, but Jesus then goes and does miracles. And it's very different from the miracles that Elijah does or Elisha does from the Old Testament. It's different from the miracles that Moses does. In every single case in the Old Testament, when someone performs some sort of miracle, in the surrounding context, it is stated that it was God who did the miracle, or the person invoked God to do the miracle, or God had commanded the person to do the miracle. However, in the case of Jesus, we see something entirely different. He does the miracles in his own name. It says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 28 through 29, The blind man came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. Faith in what? Faith in God the Father? No, he specifically said, Do you have faith in me to be able to do this? Do you have faith that I can do this? Faith in Jesus had to be demonstrated in this case, and therefore he's doing the miracle by his own authority. A leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and said, I am willing. Not, Father, please heal this man right now. He says, I am willing, be cleansed. And he was clean. Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, verse 14, when he resuscitates a dead man, he says, young man, I say to you, I say to you, arise. Very different from the case in the Old Testament with Elijah. So we see Jesus doing things in his own name, doing miracles in his own name, forgiving sins. So the actions he did shows us that he claimed to be God. The words he used shows us that he claimed to be God. Let's move on to what others did about Jesus. In Jesus' lifetime, we see two types of people at the very least. One, people who worshipped Jesus. And two, people who sentenced him to death. Jesus received worship without hesitation. We have to keep that in mind. Throughout the books of the Gospels, Jesus is worshipped. Proskuneo is the Greek word that is used in John chapter 9, in Matthew chapter 14, and in Matthew chapter 28. But keep in mind, Jesus said himself in chapter 4, verse 10, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now what's going on here? Jesus says, worship God only, using the word proskuneo, proskuneo God only, and then he accepts proskuneo, not turning it down, implicitly stating that he is God through the actions of others. By the way, that word serve is the very same word serve that Jesus accepts in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And here he's saying it belongs to God only. Others in the New Testament are constantly rebuked when they are worshipped through the word proskuneo. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is worshipped. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are worshipped. And in Revelation chapter 19, an angel is worshipped using this term proskuneo. And in every single case... These recipients said, do not do this. We are just men. Do not bow down to us. We know that this is something you're only supposed to do to God. But Jesus did not do anything of the sort. Instead, he accepts it. And in fact, in John chapter 20, he praises the person who does it. The opponents of Jesus also show that their actions uh, show that he claimed to be God. Jesus' opponents took Jesus to trial and sentenced him to death. Now, why would they do such a thing? If Jesus is not claiming to be God, if Jesus is just going around, as uh, Muslims generally say he does, he's just going around saying, follow the Old Testament, follow the Torah, uh, follow what God has told you, why would Jews sentence him to death if he's promoting Jewish law? Some might say that Jesus was promoting himself as a Messiah, and therefore he was worthy of death, but no indication, we don't have any historical indication, that people who were claiming to be Messiah were killed. But we have plenty of indication, and this is according to uh, Daryl Bach's uh, Blasphemy and Exaltation in Judaism. Uh, we have plenty of indication that people who claim to be God were killed. And finally, what others said about Jesus. 
People accused him of claiming to be God. People did call him God. And people went on to expound upon his preexistent nature as God. In Matthew chapter 9, uh, people say this fellow blasphemes, as we mentioned earlier. In John chapter 5, the Jews say he makes himself equal with God. And in John chapter 10, for blasphemy, you, a mere man, claim to be God. Over and over and over again, we have the explicit statements of the Jews. Why are they mad at him? Because he is claiming to be God. However, on the flip side, what were some of the things that his followers said? Doubting Thomas um, says, My Lord and my God, when he finally sees Jesus. Now, by saying my Lord and my God, he's not looking at Jesus saying my Lord and then looking at God saying my God. This is an argument that some people use and it's absolutely ludicrous. The Greek here demands that the, the recipient of my Lord and my God be the same person. And it is Jesus in both cases. Thomas is calling Jesus Lord and God. This is seen as the climax of the book of John when Jesus' revelation is finally made extremely clear through Thomas' words. And of course, as I said already in the next verse, Jesus praises him for saying, finally, you believe. In addition, at the very beginning of John, we see something. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being. That has come into being. So at the very beginning, now he's not saying at the beginning of the world, even before that, at the very beginning of anything, there was God and there was a word who was with God. And these were both God. Uh, therefore, the claim that the Trinity is not present, at least to some degree, in the New Testament is horribly flawed. We at least see here a uh, duality of sorts. There's a God and a word. Both were there in the beginning. And then it says... And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this thing that was in the beginning, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. He's talking about Jesus. John's prologue is making it extremely clear that in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God, and Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. So we have here from the Gospel of John a clear statement that Jesus claimed to be God, and that's the bookend for the other side of it is in John chapter 28, 20, verse 28, when Thomas proclaims Jesus as God. So let's assess the evidence so far. Jesus' own claim to deity is found in multiple early sources. Now we're talking about Matthew being an individual source, Mark being an individual source, Luke being an individual source, John being an individual source, and if you subscribe to Q theory, Q as well. All five of these sources have claimed that Jesus is divine. Beyond that, we see multiple levels of statements in these historical sources which show Jesus is claiming to be divine. For example, the Son of Man statements, which I put before you, are extremely powerful are found in didactic statements, parabolic statements, and in um, apocalyptic statements about the future. So three different modes of speaking Jesus uses to call himself the Son of Man. And therefore we can say that in different modes of speaking, in different sources, in the earliest sources, with multiple sources, Jesus claims to be divine. Now what I want to submit before you is this. A lot of people have put forth the idea that Jesus' deity came about after, some point after Jesus' life. He never actually claimed these things. These ideas evolved slowly after Jesus died, and then they were written into the New Testament. I would like to posit that this is far from anything that is substantiated by evidence. Early Christology, i.e., the view of Christ that existed in the beginning of Christianity, tells us very clearly that this is not the case. Jesus was accorded the characteristics of Yahweh from the inception of Christianity. As well, he was honored as Yahweh from the very inception of Christianity. The evidence points to this. Let's look at it. If Jesus' divinity were a late invention, then the earliest Christian writings would show a lower, more human view of Jesus. Is this not correct? If Jesus were to start off as a man and later become deified, the very earliest writings should show Jesus as just a man. However, according to Richard Bauckham, a scholar on the topic of Christology, Jewish monotheism clearly distinguished the one God and all other reality. So you have God over here and all other reality over here. The ways in which it distinguished the one God from all else did not prevent the early Christians from including Jesus into the unique divine identity of God. So what the Jews did, the early Christian Jews that is, is they said Jesus 
is a part of God, even though God has been distinguished from all of the other rest of reality. How did the Jews distinguish God from the rest of reality? God used to use, I mean, the Jews used to use two characteristics of Yahweh to distinguish God from everything else. He was the creator, and he was the one who was sovereign over all. At no point in Jewish history, in Jewish literature, um, up until this point in Jesus' life, did anyone ever ascribe sovereignty and creatorship to anyone but Yahweh. Yahweh was always the sovereign. Yahweh was always the creator. No Jew would ever say anything elsewise. However, after Jesus came along, we see he is called the creator. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, and as well in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus is given this concept of being the creator, which no one else ever had been given. In addition, he's called sovereign in 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, in Philippians, as well as in Hebrews. Keep in mind, the author of Hebrews is not Paul. Paul is, is the one who's authoring these other books. Hebrews is, authoring, uh, is being authored by somebody else. So we have two different ancient sources from the earliest stratum of Christian history who say, yes, we've always said that only God is sovereign, only God is the creator, but Jesus did those things too. From the very beginning, we see that he's being included into the identity of Yahweh. But it's not just this. He's also honored as Yahweh. We have a remarkable feature of early Christian devotional practice. This is according to Larry Hurtado. A remarkable feature of early Christian devotional practice, which was that Jesus was apparently given the sort of place that was otherwise reserved for God alone. Now, Hurtado is talking about the worship that Jesus received, what kind of acts were done towards him, what kind of symbolic uh, reverence was given towards him. And he says that this was otherwise reserved for God alone. Such acts and practices included invoking Jesus' name in healings and exorcisms, baptism in Jesus' name, and actions in Jesus' name intended to execute divine power, such as the judgment of a man in 1 Corinthians. These things were reserved for God alone, yet Jesus was being ascribed these honors and attributes. This shows that from the very inception of Christian history, we have Jesus receiving uh, titles and honors as only Yahweh receives. The rest of the New Testament is also very explicit about its concept of Jesus. Romans chapter 9, verse 5 says, Christ is overall God, blessed forever. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Colossians. For in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. An extremely strong, strong statement found in Colossians. Our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. It is clear the rest of the New Testament, as well as the Gospels, accurately, uh, I'm sorry, vividly portray Jesus as divine. In fact, the book of Hebrews even quotes an Old Testament statement saying, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and ascribes that to Jesus. So in conclusion, we can see that Jesus' claim to deity can be seen in multiple ways, including what he said, what he did, what others said, and what others did. Beyond that, the earliest Christology equates Jesus with Yahweh through his characteristics and through the honors given to him. Beyond this, Jesus is given the titles of God. He's called Savior, Judge, Light, Glory of God, Alpha and Omega, Redeemer, Forgiver of Sins, Creator of Men, Creator of Angels, Worshipped by Men, Worshipped by Angels, Addressed in Prayer, a Manifestation of God. He fills the whole universe and owns everything in it to be worshipped by all men and nations in His kingdom over which He will have eternal dominion where every knee will bow and of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. These are the statements we find about Jesus Christ. Now, for Han's task is big today. He has to show us, first, that my reasoning and evidence, and or, my reasoning or my evidence, is flawed. And, number two, provide better reasoning or evidence for his own conclusion. Now, we have to understand that Prahan is a Muslim. He, prescribes, uh, he subscribes to Islam. And so his views of Jesus can come from various directions, he will tell you what. But we have to understand that his evidence has to be stronger than mine. Mine comes from right after Jesus' time. Uh, Mark was written no later, than, no later than 70, a lot of people will say in the 50s. Paul's writings were written at least um, by the 60s, which is when he died. Um, Hebrews was written in a similar time frame. Um, Frahan has to use references that are as close to the life of Jesus, if we're going to expect them to be accurate beyond this. Uh, he has to use a reasoning that is as powerful, if not more powerful, than mine. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has to say.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين أهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم ويل المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين There is a premise that needs to be uh, established in order to comprehend the Muslim perspective on who Jesus, alayhi salam, on whom be peace, is. Now we're talking specifically about the Muslim perspective when asking this question, who is Jesus? The primary point being that Muslims depend on what we believe is the speech and direct word of God. Not any type of word or, or scripture or literature that was inspired by God, but was according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Paul, and, and these types of uh, individuals. Rather, this was revelation that was the truth and word directly from God. And we take this perspective that is given in this text that we believe is the word of God versus the Bible, which we view as a historical perspective of individuals who taught and understood their theology according to and after the establishment of the Pauline ministry. To me, this topic in a debate context is very difficult given the situation. Nevertheless, I don't want to turn this into a Quran versus Bible debate, which would take away from the issue at hand. What I would say, though, is that while the Quran was revealed 575 years after Jesus, as a believer, we should always consider truth directly from the speech of God over the conjecture of any man. And that one should not object to the issue of years when the Bible itself speaks about events and individuals who existed in most cases thousands of years prior to the respective writings. With this said, I would like to approach this debate primarily from a logical angle. And I want to make two points. But before I do so, I want to emphasize again that the New Testament is a, is a, uh, is a canon that comes after and according to the ministry of Paul, who never saw the life and times of Jesus, but instead claimed he was struck by visions some years later. A situation that, in my view, implies that the original disciples who actually did witness the life and times of Jesus could not hold the responsibility of evangelizing a theology and religion that, again, according to the Muslim perspective, was never meant to be established in the first place. What I mean is this, that according to Islam and the Quran and, and what we believe, Christianity was never supposed to be a religion that was founded and spread amongst Gentiles and so on and so forth. That, that he was sent only unto the house of Israel and that the Messiah was specifically for and exclusively for the house of Israel and the Jewish people and not for Gentiles or anybody else. In any event, I think Christians can agree with me on two specific points. The first point being that Jesus السلام, is a prophet of God. This is something that we can agree on. And the Christians will accept his status as a prophet of God uh, to the extent of saying that he is the very prophet prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 18, where it says, A prophet will be raised among your brethren. Uh, in uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, in Acts chapter 3 verse 22, will allude to this interpretation as well. And yet this very same prophecy which is supposedly about Jesus, immediately infers in verse 20 that the false prophet must die. 
Now, mind you, this chapter, chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, is supposedly a prophecy about Jesus, who is a prophet to come. And in this very, uh, in, in this very description and context uh, of this pro prophecy about Jesus, is a statement that the false prophet must die. The dilemma created here for Christians is, they either deny that Jesus is the prophet being prophesied in Deuteronomy 18, and therefore, therefore would it also admit that Acts chapter 3 verse 22 is wrong. Or, one has to accept that according to the immediate context of this prophecy, that Jesus was a false prophet because the context of this prophecy says the false prophet must die. And Jesus was crucified to death according to Christianity. The second point I think Christians can agree with, at least to some extent, is that the 100% man finite aspect of Jesus, who spent time in Mary's womb, lived as an infant, a toddler, a child, an adult, ate, slept, drank, and was limited by the laws of nature, that this aspect was indeed created. In order to get to the bottom of this, the Christian has to decide if they are going to understand their doctrines completely by literal terms, or perhaps instead envision a metaphorical or spiritual angle. If we say Jesus was literally the Son of God, since we are using literal terms here, one would therefore conclude that Jesus was somehow the biological offspring of God. I don't think that this is what the Christians believe at all. Rather, they would understand the notion from a metaphorical or spiritual angle, seeing as how God is beyond having a literal biological son. If we can agree on this, then the rest of the, of the debate should be understood within this context. And from this context, we must define who and what God is. According to John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit and should be worshipped as such. If he should be worshipped as such, then this would eliminate the possibility of worshipping any graven image, be it in the form of a clay statue, be it in the form of a painting, or be it in the form of a human being whose finite flesh, if worshipped, would be violating the notion of such idolatry. That is, unless you can find me a statement that would otherwise instruct that it is uh, 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 given an instruction that it would be okay to do so. While we can find the definition I speak of in John chapter 4 verse 24 where God is defined as being a spirit and that he should be worshipped in spirit and truth, we don't find any additional instructions that would fit into this picture where a finite flesh or object could be worshipped. If God is essentially spirit and the flesh is created, then one must distinguish the flesh from the spirit, the 100% man from the 100% deity, and worship the spiritual deity and not the created flesh or man. To avoid the inevitable conclusion that Jesus, a finite man, was not, as they say, a squared circle, or a man-god, or a god-man, infinite yet, uh, infinite yet finite, finite yet infinite being, we turn to the Pauline doctrine of kenosis from Philippians chapter 2. A doctrine which Nabil in the past has used to answer my question of whether the flesh of Jesus and the Spirit of God are different and yet one spiritually. According to this doctrine, God emptied himself. Now what exactly was emptied is a question in and of itself. If the notion is that God emptied himself in the sense that he gave up some of his divine powers in order to be a regular human being, then that would mean that Jesus was simply a man who was able to do miracles based on the presence of the Holy Spirit within himself. And if this is the case, then any Christian who has the presence of the Holy Spirit, which all believers and Christians do according to the New Testament, 
should be able to demonstrate these very same miracles. For those of you who are not familiar with the specifics of this doctrine, the doctrine of kenosis states that in order to become a man, God gave up certain powers to become limited. And yet this, in my opinion, only furthers my point that the limited version of God is not the one true, eternal, uncreated, omniscient, omnipotent God to be worshipped in spirit and truth. And it would also seem as if this emptying that God was to a, certain extent, uh, to a certain extent, changing his nature, which also goes against the Christian doctrine that God is unchanging, meaning that God was one point without flesh, and he became flesh, and he became limited. He took powers were taken away from him. And so this becomes very problematic for Christians. What I often ask Christians, is that if you believe Jesus is God, and you worship Jesus as God, and these individuals were worshiping Jesus as God in the New Testament, what aspect of Jesus were they worshiping? Were they worshiping the 100% man, the created finite flesh that was before them? Or were they worshiping the Spirit of God that dwelled within Him and with Him and with all believers and within all uh, within all believers and with all believers. Was the spirit that he represented what you acknowledge and worship as your God, or was it, or is it that you worship a finite uh, individual that God created? If you say that you are worshiping the spirit and that the flesh is simply a physical manifestation, then your beliefs are not that far from Islam. In the sense that Jesus was a prophet of God, we agree. He was a creation of God, we perhaps can agree. He was 100% man. And yet the Spirit of God dwelled with him and within him, and he represented that Spirit and was, therefore, the embodiment of the Word of God. I don't think there can be any significant disagreement between Christians and Muslims if this is the interpretation that they have. The problem comes when the Christian attempts to make Jesus who was born unto Mary, the son of Mary, the literal God in every sense of the term. The question that I have is to what extent can we take this literally? Or can there be a spiritual definition where one would not compromise John 4.24 that God should be worshipped not in a flesh form but in a form of spirit? Now, Nabil gave to you a demonstration from the New Testament, a very well thought out demonstration from the New Testament, and I commend him for that. And I truly believe that Paul believed that Jesus was God, and that Paul worshipped Jesus as God, and that his followers believed Jesus was God, and worshipped Jesus as such. I believe that the canon is definitely influenced according to his theology and his ministry. And with respect to that, I can understand why, according to the New Testament, that Nabil, or any Christian for that matter, would believe that Jesus is God. So I will not argue with him with, in reference to that. Assuming, of course, he quoted the Bible numerous times. But assuming that the New Testament is, in fact, the, the inspired word of God. And that is a debate in of itself. But what I'm here to establish for, for, for the listeners is that according to Islam, if you believe that Islam is the truth and the Qur'an is the truth and that also is something that needs to be analyzed, then according to the Qur'an, we always, always must take the word of God versus the historical perspectives and interpretations and beliefs of, of men. And that is why this debate 
of who is Jesus isn't really a debate at all. It's two distinct perspectives based on two totally different books. And so with that said, I conclude my opening statement. All right, so there was a lot that was said in uh, those 12 minutes. Uh, Farhan has uh, really uh, provided an excellent case to begin with, and let's, let's take a look at it. I provided most, much of my case uh, from what we can say was historically well-established. The whole point of my using the Son of Man statements, the I Am statements, the sitting at the right hand of the power statements, is because these statements, though found in Mark 14, verse 62, are also found in many, many places. Like I said before, all five of the Gospels use the Son of Man statements as well as in three different separate ways. I'm sorry, all four Gospels plus the Q, if you believe in Q theory, uh, use the Son of Man statements uh, in three multiple different ways. And not only that, but the I Am statements. By the way, check this out. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of, uh, in, throughout the Old Testament, God uses the words I am in order to uh, portray his divine sovereignty seven times. And once he uses double emphasis for that. In the book of John, John has Jesus using the I am statements seven times and once for double emphasis. So you see an exact parallel in multiple ways between John's uh, portrayal of uh, Jesus using the I am statements as well as the Old Testament. And so we see Jesus being uh, constantly proclaiming over and over things um, that show his deity. You see those in multiple places, in multiple ways. It's so very strong. Again, you see the I am statements not just in the book of John. You see in the book of Matthew, the book of Mark. Then you see sitting at the right hand of the power. This statement, by the way, where Jesus claims to be sitting at the right hand of the power is so well entrenched in early Christianity that it is the most quoted scripture from the Old Testament found in the New Testament. You see it all over the place in the New Testament, including Paul's writings and the Gospel. You see it all over the place. So what I used were verses that were found in multiple places, from multiple times, in multiple different ways, in order to show that Jesus claimed to be God. For Han's response to this um, was that, well, we know Paul has uh, had his ministry before any of the New Testament writings were written. Therefore, Paul's beliefs affected all these New Testament writings. Well, the problem is, is my approach shows if maybe Paul had affected one person or two people or three people, uh, it still wouldn't work because these statements are used all over the place. They're seen in various places. Uh, so just the approach I use uh, goes against what Prahan says. Not only that, I based most of my case off the book of Mark, which is the earliest of the Gospels, and Mark is contemporary with Paul. There's no reason why we have to think that Paul's uh, influenced Mark in any way whatsoever. But beyond that, uh, did Paul affect the New Testament teachings? I think that the evidence is squarely against any of these, any conclusion of the sort. For example, um, parts of Paul are considered to be pre-Pauline. When Paul quotes um, the, uh, the statement in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, he goes through and he reads who the risen Jesus appeared to. And of course, he concludes with himself saying, and last of all, he appeared to me as of one untimely born. When he's using this whole verse here, what he's doing, or these verses, what he's doing is he's quoting an old hymn, um, uh, an Aramaic hymn or a uh, creed, if you will. Now, that creed, he's quoting, he said, it was told to me, therefore it had to come before Paul. And if it, was, if it came before Paul, it had to be formulated. And if it had to be formulated, it had some sort of belief within a church um, so that people would come together and formulate something like this. So it had to be known by people before it was formulated into the form of a creed. So we see this part of Paul's writings going back well before Paul actually wrote the letter, well before he actually met the people who formulated it, well before they actually formulated it, back into the earliest part of post-Jesus era. Now, what point in time is, are these verses dated to? According to non-Christian scholars now, we're talking atheist and agnostic scholars, who are very much against the concept that Jesus is God, they have dated this portion of the New Testament to somewhere between six months and five years after Jesus' death. So the statement that is found here is Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. And this statement, that Jesus died and rose from the dead, is something that is so early in Christianity, it is found somewhere between six months and five years after Jesus' death. 
Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that these early statements are, cannot have been affected by Paul when Paul is the one who heard them from other people. Beyond that, we see Paul going back to the disciples in, uh, in the book of Acts over and over again. He goes back to the disciples and asks them, am I preaching the gospel properly? In other words, am I running in vain? Or is what I'm saying what Jesus actually taught to you guys? So as opposed to the idea that Paul influenced the disciples, much rather Paul was going back to make sure over and over again that the disciples told Paul exactly what they needed to tell him and that he was following along with those concepts. Beyond this, it just boggles my mind that uh, a Muslim can say uh, that Paul affected the early Muslims, uh, the early disciples. The reason why is because in the Quran, it says very clearly that the disciples were well led in regards to um, in regards to divine uh, divine um, authority. It says here in chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 55, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. So what is it saying here in the Quran? The Quran is saying that God told Jesus that his followers would be superior. They'd be uppermost over anyone who came against them. But then what is Rahan saying? Farhan saying is Jesus' disciples fell immediately to Paul as soon as Paul came and influenced all of them with his beliefs. And in what way did they fall? Was it in some minor way? No. They fell in such a major way that they're willing to go to their deaths to proclaim that Jesus was God. Wow. According to the Quran, Jesus' disciples were uppermost. According to Farhan, Jesus' disciples were pansies. Uh, this, this, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make sense in my mind. Um, beyond this, uh, what I wanted to talk about is that um, the statements that Jesus claimed to be God are found not just in, um, in, in this era as well. Uh, we see, um, uh, for example, I'm sorry, Larry Hurtado, uh, who is again the author who subscribes to the idea that Jesus received honors, which show them that he was God. What he says here is that Paul was coming into the picture in such a way that he already had to presuppose that the people knew Jesus was God. Let's say that one more time. When Paul was writing his letters out to the churches, he was writing it in such a manner that the people there already knew Jesus was God. To read this, it says, There is really no basis for thinking either that Paul was particularly responsible for inventing the view that Jesus is to be reverenced as divine, or that this view of Jesus distinguished the churches that he established. In fact, all the evidence points to the opposite conclusion. Devotion to Jesus that Paul affirms in his letters was manifest already in the very earliest circles of Jewish Christians, including those of the very first years, even months, in Roman Judea. So what Larry Hurtado, a scholar of Christology, is saying there's absolutely no evidence that Paul influenced early Christians. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It was Paul himself who was influenced by these beliefs. And that makes sense, does it not? Paul is going from place to place killing Christians. Why is he doing that? What could incite this man to go and kill people left and right? At least take them and put them in prison. What can, can get this man to do that? And what Hurtado offers, and what I agree with, is that the only thing that makes sense is these men were offending the Jewish sensibilities in such a way that he could not suffer it. And in what way would they do that? They would be attacking the concept of Yahweh's sovereignty in his mind. He would say that they're ascribing equals to Yahweh. So even before Paul becomes a Christian, we see that the way he reacts to Christianity indicates that the deity of Christ was firmly established amongst the earliest stratum of Christians. Moving on from this fact, again, I, I, if, if this is brought back up, I would love to talk about it a little bit more. Um, Farhan has also brought up the doctrine of kenosis. He said, how is it that God could empty himself? God does not empty himself in such a way, um, according to Farhan. Uh, God cannot empty himself like that. Um, I, mean, I may be misrepresenting you. If I am, let me know in the next rebuttal. But from what I understand, that's what Farhan had said. Now, keep in mind, God can do all sorts of things that he does not do. For example, um, when we are all given free will, God has the ability to step into our lives and force us to do whatever he wants. Does he not? God can make us do whatever he wants. Does he want us to go worship him every, every day? Forget every Sunday, every day. Um, go to church and listen to a sermon? Yeah, he can make us do that. 
Uh, does he want us to do anything, anything at all? He can make us do whatever he wanted to, but does he? No, he restrains his power willingly. He doesn't have to exercise every power that he has. Similarly, when in the doctrine of kenosis, when God emptied himself into the form of a man, Jesus, though still in the form of God, never ever decided to use those divine capabilities that he had. Just as God can control us, Jesus could do all sorts of things here that he chose to not do in order to pay for our sins. Now, according to uh, Richard Bauckham, this could not have been expected, but it is not uncharacteristic of God. It is novel, but appropriate to the identity of the God of Israel. In other words, that God would love us so much that he would do that for us is appropriate to the character of the God of Israel. How much time do I have left? You have uh, almost exactly time. Excellent. So the question is then asked, well, Nabil, um, how can you know that when Jesus is saying he's a son of God, that this is something that we're supposed to take literally, uh, that he's not saying this metaphorically? Well, number one, I would say we need to define our terms better. I'm not saying that Jesus is the offspring of the father, that the father had a relationship with someone and then that caused offspring. I'm not saying that. No one is saying that. This, the word son itself is not being used in a biological sense, but it is being used in the sense of Jesus being related to God in such a way that none of us had that relationship with God. It's a special son. It's not the son of God like Adam was considered the son of God. It's not the sons of God as people in the Old Testament were considered. The son of God position that Jesus has is very different from the son of God position that the rest of us have. And for Han would say, why? What's your evidence for thinking that? Why do you think Jesus has a special relationship with God? Well, aside from all the quotations in the book of John, which shows that Jesus requires people to honor him as God is honored, where Jesus says, for example, in John 14, verse 13, that he can answer people's prayers if they pray in his name. Aside from all of this, we know that Jesus claimed special prerogatives that no one else ever has the right to claim. I've already mentioned this. Jesus was worshipped, and he let people worship him. Jesus had said he had the ability to forgive people his sins, and he did that. So Jesus is not just doing something metaphorical that people in the past have done. He's doing something extremely different that no one can do unless they're claiming to be God. The question at this point should not be, is Jesus claiming to be God? It's, is he accurate when he claims to be God? Uh, Farhan posed this question to me two years ago in August um, of 2006, almost three years ago now. And I thought I answered it then, but I'll answer it again. He says, when you Christians worship Jesus, are you worshiping the flesh or the spirit? The created flesh, he says, is something that if you worship, you're worshiping a graven image. But if you're worshiping the spirit, then you're worshiping the spirit, which is in all of us, the spirit of God. And that's okay, in a sense. Number one, I will say, no, we're not worshiping the flesh of Jesus. The flesh of Jesus is something earthly. We do not worship the flesh. We worship the spirit, as you rightly uh, quoted. However, I am not about to concede that the spirit of God lives in all of us as equally as it did in Jesus. Uh, Jesus proclaimed to have a spirit of God that was entirely different to us. And again, uh, keep in mind, Farhan, that Jesus is claiming to do things that no one else can do but God, God himself. He has separated himself. He's made himself distinct from everyone else. So perhaps everyone has the spirit of God in themselves in as much as they are created in the image of God. But the difference here is that God himself has come into the world. That is what we are worshiping, God in this world, in his spirit. Keep in mind that all you need to answer that question is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. It says it very clearly, the word was with God, the word was God. Nothing came into being but through that word, and then that word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is very different. That word is very different from any spirit that we or anyone in this room could ever have, except for God, who I do believe is in this room. You compare um, the God-man uh, as a square circle, that this is something that cannot happen. I would just simply ask you why. Why is that? That shows that you have a presupposition here that not all of us subscribe to. God can, in fact, do whatever he wants, can he not? As long as he does not contradict himself to a degree, as long as he's not, for example, lying, God cannot lie, God cannot conduct evil himself, uh, God cannot go against his nature in that way. However, God becoming a man is not something that we've ever been told he cannot do. Um, so I have to ask you, how, how is it that you are so certain that God being a man is like a square circle. The last thing I would like to talk about uh, before, before giving Farhan the floor is this concept that Muslims depend directly on the words from God, whereas Christians are depending on something according to, for example, the gospel according to Matthew or the gospel according to Luke. 
Quran, I'm telling you, the Quran is the word of God according to Muhammad. Uh, we don't know that Muhammad actually saw God, in fact, or spoke to God. In fact, he didn't speak to God. He spoke to Gabriel. So it's the word of Gabriel according to Muhammad. Um, and beyond that, he doesn't even know if it's Gabriel. His wife told him it was Gabriel. He thought it was a demon. Um, so what we have here is a series of layers of problems here. And beyond that, of course, we know that Muhammad's words weren't even collected in the form of a codex until Uthman's time. So it's the word of God according to Uthman, according to Muhammad, according to Gabriel the demon. Um, this is a series of problems. And to just look at what the New Testament says and say, this is uh, the word of God according to Matthew or according to Luke, you're ascribing, in, uh, you're inconsistent in your criteria for the Quran versus the New Testament. We can talk about this further if you choose to. I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say in your rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Qureshi. Now, Mr. Qureshi, this is just not going to get old, by the way. <laughs> I'll stop now. Farhan. Thank you, Nabil, uh, for that response. Um, Okay, I want to start off with the last point that he made with reference to the Qur'an being the word of God according to Muhammad. Now, of course, this would have to be something that would be debated. But what I think Nabil and I can agree on, and what Muslims and Christians can agree on, is that the Muslim perspective is that the Qur'an is the very word and speech of God. This isn't something that Christians believe about the New Testament. Rather... The Christians will agree with my assertions that the gospel according to remains to be the perspectives of those individuals, but was inspired by God because they had uh, the presence of this Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. So the, so the notion is different. The notion remains that this is the gospel according to the conjectures and perceptions and beliefs and interpretations of these individuals. But additionally, that these individuals were inspired, so to say, by the Holy Spirit. Not that these words in the New Testament were the very words and speech of God. So with reference to the perspective of how Muslims view the Quran and how Christians view the New Testament, that we as Muslims, when examining the question, who is Jesus, would base our beliefs on what we consider to be the word and speech of God versus the conjectures and interpretations and beliefs of men that were supposedly inspired by, 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 by a spirit. The, even though they were inspired, it was still from their own recollection. Uh, for example, Luke writes in uh, his very first chapter, the first three verses, uh, many have taken in hand uh, in, uh, in order to set a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. And it seems good to me also to write to you in orderly account. There's a, there's a couple of things to pay attention to here. First of all, that Luke is acknowledging that while I'm writing what I am writing, that this is a narrative according to my perspective and what I believe and what I've been taught. Of course, Luke was also an individual who, did, who like Paul, did not witness the life and times of Jesus. But he, too, was going to write this narrative. Also, what one must pay attention to here is that Luke alludes that that many have written uh, narratives. Um, at the time of this writing, uh, the only the gospels, the only gospel that was uh, written at this point of time was the gospel according to Mark. The question uh, remains is, where are these many narratives that Luke is talking about? John had not yet been written. Um, Ma Matthew and Mark were the primary sources. And would one or two sources, and you can add Q to, to if you believe in the Q theory also, would one, two, or three sources be considered many narratives? Uh, and that is, uh, is something that one, one would have to debate uh, as well. Uh, Nabil then uh, asserts that only six months after the fact, and even non-believers can affirm that, uh, that there was an issue going on about the crucifixion. But I think when defining and asking the question, who is Jesus, and the primary arguments that he gave in his opening statement pertain to the deity 
of Jesus, that Jesus was God or God in the flesh, however you want to interpret or you were worded, and not pertains to crucifixion. In fact, the Quran also acknowledges the fact that there was some type of an incident where Jesus was was crucified according to some Muslims. He was actually cruci put put on a crucifix but did not die on it. So I don't think that there's a dispute over the six month uh, reference that you gave rather what it, it, was there any doctrine, any belief before Paul? Is there any documentation of anything before Paul's ministry that where we could definitely refer to and say, yes, people believe that Jesus was God before Paul came to Christianity and started preaching to the Gentiles uh, and the Jews? And I don't think that there exists any such documentation. Rather, Paul's writings seem to be the, very much the earliest writings in the New Testament. Okay, now, uh, he also uh, talked about the verse of the Quran where it says that God had blessed uh, the, 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 the disciples of Jesus, which is true. Uh, God did. But according to chapter 5, verse 116, after Jesus was taken back to, to, to God and he ascended into heaven. Uh, the verse of the Quran reads uh, that, and it questions, did you, Jesus, say to the people to worship me and, and, uh, and to worship your mother as two gods beside Allah? And, um, and he responded according to the text of the Quran, glory be to thee, never could I say uh, what I had no right. Had I said such a thing, you, you would have known it. And you know what is in my heart, uh, and uh, I know not what is in your heart. And Jesus continues to say that as soon as you took me to yourself, I don't, I wasn't responsible for them. I don't know what happened after uh, after you had taken me to, to to yourself. So this verse proves that after the point that Jesus was ascended, according to the Quran, after Jesus was ascended. It was at that point that misguidance had began uh, as far as Jesus' followers go. And, and, I, and I emphasize again in the beginning of my statement that Christianity was never supposed to be a religion according to the context of Islam. According to the teachings of Islam, Islam is the very is the only way of life and the religion of all of the prophets and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, the prophets of God had congregations and they had missions, uh, but whether Christianity was, according to Islam, supposed to be a religion, uh, is, it, according to Islam it was not. And then uh, Nabil also says that how can you say that God cannot do something? I'm not here to say that God cannot uh, do something. Or, or, rather, what I'm here to question is God does certain things and he doesn't do certain things. It reminds me of the Hindu notion that says that why, that God is not limited like us human <laughs> beings. We human beings are limited. We have two arms. But look at our God. He has six arms. And, and, and they manifest them, and God manifests himself in, in these various methods. Why can't God have six arms? Why can't uh, God uh, spiritually dwell within, within statues and so on and so forth? Uh, why couldn't God come as a woman? All of these questions could be asked. But there are certain things that God does and does not do. There are certain things that God did and, and, uh, and did not do. And this is the de definition of the nature of God. That if God changes from one thing to another, that is a change of nature. And that is something that I also mentioned, I believe, in my opening statement. That if God emptied himself at one point, as the doctrine of kenosis states, then that would be a changing in nature. And the Christians have always asserted, and the Christian theologians have always asserted, that God is unchanging. But at this point, God, God who was not uh, limited as a man, finite creation, but now is, and that would, again, be a change in nature, and, and this, is, this is an issue with the doctrine of kenosis. Now, Nabil also says that he doesn't worship the flesh, and that the flesh is not what is supposed to be worshipped uh, uh, by Christians. And uh, I'm glad that he agrees with this, 
But I guess my question would be, oh, in his opening statement, he alluded to the notion that Thomas was someone that worshipped Jesus. That there were various Christians worshipping Jesus. So when they were worshipping Jesus, were they bowing down to him, the physical person that existed there, and worshipping his flesh? Or were they worshipping the spirit that he represented? And therefore not literally and physically the man that was before them. And Nabil also asserts that Jesus having the Spirit of God is different. Uh, it's, it's different, but he really didn't explain to me how it is different. If Jesus is, is a man, and, he is a, and the 100% man aspect of him was indeed a creation of God, then how did that man spiritually have the, the presence of God than, than a different, than, a, than, a, than an ordinary believer? And where can you provide evidences from your perspective in the New Testament that this was the case? We also, uh, he also touched on the issue that no, Jesus is not the biological son of God. This is not what Christians believe. And I know this. The Christians don't believe this. But my, my point with that was that when we say that someone is the son of someone else, if we take this literally, then one would have to say that someone is the biological son of this person. But this is not the case. So if you admit that, that Jesus is not literally the son of God, then, then, and that he is a special type of son of God, then you have automatically agreed with me. That this, that this notion, that this concept is a metaphorical and spiritual concept altogether and not a literal concept. And if so, then how are we going to interpret who and what Jesus is and who and what God is literally? If according to John chapter 4, God is spirit and should be worshipped as such and does not change from this nature then God emptying himself and losing his divinity and changing his nature to a certain extent could not, uh, could not coexist with the definition that, that, that we're providing here. And again, uh, Nabil touched on whether the notion of someone being infinite yet finite, finite yet infinite, man yet God, God yet man, would this be a oxymoron? Would this be a concept of, uh, of a squared circle? And the idea is, it, again, if God is an unchanging God and has existed from the beginning of time, then, then he would remain just that. But upon this emptying, again, it, it, there seems to be a change. And would Nabil agree that this is a changing in nature? Something that wasn't before, something that was, did not exist before, i.e. the flesh of Jesus, that uh, again uh, was born from the womb of Mary, that spent time uh, as an unfertilized egg to, a, to an infant, to, to, uh, to, to a toddler, to a child, to an adult who ate, slept, drank, this whole 100% man aspect of Jesus that Christians themselves believe in, that he was 100% man, yet 100% deity, what do you mean when you say that? That there are two aspects that exist here, the created flesh and the uncreated spirit. And that we are not worshipping the created flesh that existed within the realms of this world, but the uncreated flesh that, that's, that, 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 that he represented. And if that is the case, and if that is the case, then Christians are seriously, seriously misunderstanding who and what Jesus really was. Thank you, Farhan. Um, so we are now going to rebuttals. There are 10 minutes each. And we will begin when Nabil is ready. No Qureshi joke this time? <laughs> yeah, it's old. Uh, 
Okay, so we got a lot of responses there. Um, the thing about rebuttals is that it's hard to follow along sometimes because points are made and you're just responding to them as they came. So uh, I'll try to explain the organization of my responses as I go along. Please try to follow me. Uh, the first thing that Farhan said is uh, Muslims view of the Quran as the word of God, whereas Christians agree the Bible is inspired by God, but not the actual word of God. Uh, first off, I think he's just wrong. Muslims do not agree, I'm sorry, Christians do not agree that the Bible is not the word of God. Even though God did not do a hard inspiration of every single uh, word, a hard dictation of every single word, we do believe that the end product is entirely the word of God. Um, and not only that, though, even, even if you disagree with me on that point, here's what you won't disagree with me on. The actual inspiration of the wording is not the point. The point is that, is there truth in this message that is sanctioned by God? Muslims believe that the Qur'an has message sanctioned by God. That's the whole point. That's why they go with that. Christians believe that the Bible has truth sanctioned by God. That's the point. That's what actually matters. This whole concept of how, to what degree did God inspire the wording is just a distraction. Then you said, um, many have undertaken, uh, according to Luke, many have undertaken to write Gospels. Uh, on the one hand, I would, I would like to say, you're right, that is a verse in the book of Luke. However, uh, just because many undertook to write it doesn't mean that many actually did finish the product um, or actually came up with anything as an end product. I'm not going to say that uh, it's, uh, I'm not saying that no one came up with anything and the, the Gospel of Luke is the only Gospel that was written at that point in time. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that you're using a verse that is not clearly indicating what you're intending for it to indicate and that Luke's writing was just one of many that anyone could listen to. Uh, he was intending to get a very explicit narration of what happened, using as many sources as he could, doing the best research he could. And I would posit that that is why Luke's account is canonical and others are not. You then said, um, is there anything? Is there anything before Paul that shows us that people believe Jesus was divine? You entirely forgot to respond to what I said, uh, which is that Paul's anger at Christians before he became a Christian cannot be explained by anything except for their reverence of Jesus as a God. Um, it does not make sense. Number one, there's two reasons why. Let me further expound upon this. Number one, it doesn't make sense for someone to just go haywire on a group of people from Jerusalem uh, without reason. Number two, what was it that finally resolved Paul? Uh, what made it to where Paul stopped being angry at these Christians and instead joined them? It was when he realized what the identity of Jesus actually was. So the identity of Jesus was central to the reason why Paul was angry. And I posit that the only thing about the identity of Jesus that could make Paul angry when he was a Jew was that it was raised to the level of Yahweh. I would like a response to this in your next rebuttal. Um, also, uh, I would like to mention that uh, the Carmen Christi, uh, in other words, uh, what we were talking about in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11, you said, Nabil, um, you're referring to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 3 through 8, and you're saying, well, this is definitely something that came six months to five years after Jesus. I would like to posit that even if that stuff is historical, which it is, it still makes Islam false on the grounds of Jesus not dying on the cross. However, you're right. The topic for today is the deity of Christ. And then you ask, is there something early that shows us that Christians believe in the deity of Christ? And my response is, Yes, the Carmen Christi was also a Christian ode. It was something that predated Paul. It is not something that Paul wrote. He quoted it as if it had been an ode that people had been reciting before his time. Again, when he sent the letter, he was presupposing that the people who were there knew this ode. According to uh, Hurtado again, by the way, the reason I'm quoting from Hurtado is because he is not what we would call uh, an evangelical Christian like us. Uh, he's um, a scholar who does not espouse that opinion, but he does say this. Had Paul composed the passage uh, in the process of writing his letter to Philippi, I suggest we would expect him to have described Jesus' self-humbling with more explicit reference to it as done for others. However, within the limits of chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, the focus is entirely on Jesus' self-humbling. God's answering exaltation of him and the intended outcome of all this with no direct reference to any benefit to others. Furthermore, the real apex of the actions recited in this passage is in verses 9 through 11, where Jesus is in, Jesus' incomparable exaltation and his ultimate purpose are portrayed. So what he's saying essentially here is that Paul had no reason to make this passage up the way it is. If he were going to make it up, he would have said something entirely different. However, when he quoted, because he's making a point, he's making a point about being humble, but when he quoted it, the way he quoted it portrayed that the point of the ode itself was something different. He was just using part of it. 
Uh, and Hurtado posits, and I agree with Hurtado, that he would not have just invented this. Therefore, it's something pre-Pauline. Beyond that, the form of it shows that it's pre-Pauline. And beyond that, uh, the recognition among scholars today is that the Carmen Christi is pre-Pauline. And of course, what does the Carmen Christi say? It says that Jesus was in the form of God and he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. So yes, we have many, many, many reasons to think that the deity of Christ predated Paul. Uh, Farhan is asked again, um, when Jesus, if Jesus was God and he emptied himself, isn't that akin to God changing his nature? Uh, isn't that akin to um, uh, something that we know cannot happen according to the Old Testament? God cannot change his nature. Uh, my response to that is this. You did not, first, you did not respond to uh, the concept of a limitation of God. God can apply uh, limits upon himself as he does to us all the time. He says uh, he does not force us to do certain things. He does not make us do things that he could make us do. Similarly, when he limits himself in the way he did during the kenosis, we have no reason to think he can't limit himself in that way. It's a very similar limitation process. Um, he also said, what is, what is it that people are worshiping? He, re he posed the question again, if Jesus is 100% man and Jesus is 100% God, then what in the world... Uh, this doesn't make any sense, is what he's saying. He can't be both. Make this make sense for me. Uh, well, I would like to say it simply this way. Uh, Farhan, when we die, uh, is our body uh, going to go with us to heaven? Is, in other words, is this body that we have now a part of who we are? No. Uh, we have a spirit. Uh, we have a spirit that's separate from our body. In the same way, Jesus had a spirit that was separate from his body, but his spirit is not the same quality as our spirit. It's that of God's spirit. That's why it was worshipped without hesitation. That's why we can pray to it uh, and get whatever we ask for in his name, according to John 14, 13. So I would respond again, we are not worshipping the spirit that Jesus represented. We are worshipping the spirit of Jesus himself. There's a big difference there. Um, apparently I have half my time remaining. I've never gotten through a rebuttal and said everything I wanted to say. So I'm going to make up some stuff on the fly. Uh, what about, and, and this, is, this is some stuff that uh, I think is very important. The topic of today's debate is who was Jesus? Not is Nabil's view of Jesus accurate? Uh, someone has to provide their own version of Jesus as well. Uh, that's someone being uh, for Hunt. He has to provide a reason why his Jesus is the real view of Jesus. Now, I would, I would, maybe I missed it, but I don't recall any evidence he provided for saying that Jesus was of a certain view that he espoused. In fact, I don't recall him saying anything about his view of Jesus. He simply told me about my view of Jesus. At most, he's mentioned that Jesus was a prophet and Christians agree with this. And in fact, we do agree with Jesus as a prophet. However, the Christian view of prophet is different from the Islamic view. But my question to Farhan is, what is your view of Jesus? It seems to me that your view of Jesus has a lot to do with the Quran. Uh, the Quran which came centuries after Muhammad, I mean after Jesus. It came from a man who was hundreds of miles away, hundreds of years later, uh, not without, a, without even being able to read the early manuscripts, without even being able to read any of these things. The only reason we would ever accept your position of who Jesus is, is if we first presuppose that Islam is correct. So first, Islam is correct, then we can end up with Farhan's point of view. However, that's what we call circular reasoning. If you have to first presuppose a view and then try to prove that view from that presupposition, that's circular. Uh, the fact of the matter is, no one would see Jesus the way you see him unless you first accept Islam for whatever reason. Uh, this is the last debate in a series of debates. We first debated, uh, is the Quran miraculous? Then we debated, was Jesus crucified? This morning we debated, uh, who is Muhammad? And now we're debating, who is Jesus? All these topics tie in together. And even though I'm not about to go in depth on the Quran right now, or in depth on the crucifixion, we have to understand that all the evidence for the Christian view of Jesus is firmly founded right next to Jesus' life. This man died according to all the evidence that we have. That's part of who Jesus is, the fact that he died under the watch of Pontius Pilate. This man then rose from the dead according to the earliest scriptures and also according to all the evidence that we have. And he also claimed to be God. According to all the evidence that we have, anything close to his life at all, it all supports Christianity. Now, if you want to believe the Islamic view of Jesus, for example, number one, that he gave life to clay birds. Number two, that he spoke uh, as a baby. As soon as he was born, he started speaking. We have to believe in scriptures that were written hundreds of years after Jesus. 
Now I ask you, why believe a scripture written hundreds of years after Jesus when we have so many other scriptures written right by Jesus' life? There is no reason unless you presuppose an alternate truth. And I posit that to you, Farhan, I would ask you, please show us how your position of Jesus, what it is, please tell me what it is, I haven't heard it yet, and then show me why your position of Jesus is stronger than my position, is based off of better evidence, based off of better reasoning, and uh, from there we'll, we'll address your evidence and see if it stacks up against the case for the Christian view of Jesus. Um, the last thing I would want to say is that uh, when Farhan mentioned in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 55, that, uh, that God was going to um, grant victory. Uh, um, or I'm sorry, when he said that Jesus went up to heaven and, and now he says, I don't know what my disciples are doing. He has misquoted uh, the Quran there. He hasn't taken the whole, the whole concept into picture. The, the Quran does say that the disciples would be uppermost, that these guys would prevail. And yet, according to Farhan, uh, the disciples failed so miserably that they, they spent three years at least with Jesus, if not more. And as soon as he's dead, uh, this man who, according to Farhan, only proclaimed to be a prophet, all of a sudden they start calling him God. They think he died on the cross when he actually didn't die on the cross. And they start a religion which, for the rest of humanity, uh, uh, misleads people into saying that a man was God. Uh, according to Farhan, that is what actually happened. I posit that... Um, we should take a clearer interpretation of the actual evidence and say that Jesus himself claimed to be God. Jesus himself said he would die on the cross and that he did die and rise from the dead. Thank you. All right. Go on. The point that I want to bring up again is that uh, the question that was brought up that uh, can God be limited? Can God limit himself? And uh, whether this changes his nature when he becomes limited and if one should worship the limited God or the unlimited God. And if one is not, again, worshiping the un... If, if one is not worshiping the limited God but, it, what, but is actually worshiping the unlimited uh, God and is, it, is worshiping the uncreated God versus the created flesh, then the argument still stands in the sense that you are not literally worshiping Jesus, uh, the man that walked the earth 2,000 years ago. Rather, you are worshiping him, you are worshiping, again, the spirit that he represents. Now, Nabil also said that, well, Jesus simply had a different spirit. I think he's, he's, uh, he's mistaking mistakening the, the concept of there being, first of all, the, of a human being, the flesh. Second of all, the spirit, which is referred to as the spirit of God and, uh, and the soul. And while you and I and everyone else can have a soul, that is different than having a spirit of God. And all believers, according to uh, Ephesians, according to the New Testament, uh, have God within them, and God, the, the verse is exactly that one God who is Father of all, and who is above all, and through all, and in all. So, the Spirit of God exists with the believers, but that is different than the notion of one individual having a different soul than the next individual. With regards to uh, any evidence, whether there are any evidence reference to if anyone believed that Jesus was God prior to the conversion and ministry of Paul of Tarsus, uh, there, there are two arguments that he gives. Uh, the first argument, um, which is that him persecuting Christians definitely, definitely means that, uh, uh, that Christians before, uh, that Christians were believing that he was God. Again, this is supposing and assuming that this is the reason uh, why he was persecuting them and, and so on and so forth. It is entirely a theory, and I can respect that theory, but that is exactly all that it remains is an assumption. That Paul was persecuting Christians, and this definitely equals a belief that Jesus was, uh, was God. 
The other uh, evidence that he brings uh, is, is what he called an ode of, of, of Carmen Christi. And uh, being an honest apologist, since I don't know what this is, I can't speak in reference to it, nor could I refute it. One would have to study exactly what he's referring to and in, in, in master an understanding of what he's uh, uh, referring to in order to respond to it, and I give him that respect. Nabil then questions, um, okay, back to the, wait, first, the first issue being uh, the Qur'an being the word of God versus the New Testament being the perspectives and, and conjectures of certain individuals. Again, this is simply a Muslim position about why we believe what we believe in, in reference to anything. We believe in it because the Qur'an, we believe in the Qur'an to be the truth, and essentially that is why we take any perspective at all and, and Christians believing in the New Testament would be the same thing. Well, why do you believe something? Because the New Testament says so. And there is, no, there is nothing wrong with that. Rather, one would ha simply have to prove whether the New Testament is reliable, uh, is, is reliable in that sense and the Muslim would have to prove if the Qur'an is reliable in that sense. But as far as our definition of who Jesus is, we are not going to go to the New Testament in a book that we do not believe in to make arguments and define who Jesus is for us. Nor are we going to go to the New Testament and define for ourselves who and what God is if this is a book and a scripture that we don't believe in. The idea here is that even in the New Testament and also the Old Testament, there are events and individuals that are talked about who existed thousands of years before those writings were written down. One would not doubt the authenticity of these stories based upon the simple assumption. Rather, one would base it on the fact that this is a revelation of God and God is revealing to us cert certain things that occurred thousands of years ago. And if that is the case, we can trust those writings. And when we say that we take the Qur'an as, a, as our, our belief in, in how we interpret who and what Jesus was, we, we do so with the understanding that this is from the knowledge and truth of God and not from the knowledge and perspective and words and perceptions and interpretations of any man. What I think the Nabil would agree with, and, I, and that the reason why I initially quoted Luke 1 was not to elude that there's many Gospels and, and we don't know where these Gospels are. Rather, I was trying to point out that this was simply a narrative according to one individual. This was a perspective according to one individual. And while Nabil may say that essentially it represents uh, the truth from God, it isn't the literal verbatim word and truth and knowledge from God untainted by human, by, 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 uh, human fallacy and fallibility. And one thing that we have with the Qur'an just to mention is that the, the utterances in the history and the biography and, 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 and the history of Muslim civilization and, and the life of the Prophet ﷺ, they were entirely separated and the verses of the Qur'an which we believe is a verbatim speech of God and, and these are the verses that are miraculous, they were isolated and separated completely for the very purpose that no words of men, no interpretations of men, no statements of Muhammad or anyone else should be contained within these isolated verses. And this is what we believe is the, 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 the truth of God revealed to Prophet Muhammad And it is according to this scripture that we define who Moses is, who Abraham is, who Jesus is, and not according to the perceptions of certain individuals. So I would equate the, the idea of trying to say, well, give me evidence for who Jesus is according to your scripture. The idea here isn't to give, 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 give an evidence 
for why we believe in G Jesus for who he was, nor for any other prophet, wh why we define him in certain ways. Rather, the, the, the notion here that I, that I sta stated from the outset relies on a different debate altogether, the Quran or the New Testament. And that's why the issue of who is Jesus, according to Muslims and Christians, is not a debate at all that can be had. Rather, the true debate is Quran versus the Bible, versus the New Testament, which, which is more trustworthy. And one would have to go according to the prophetic statements, according to the scientific statements, according to the archaeological statements contained within each text, the New Testament and the Quran, and see if, if each unique book is the, the Word of God. And that would be covered through, through numerous debates, whether it be sciences or, or, or uh, authenticity and what have you. So uh, with that, I hope uh, that you are able to understand at least that the Muslim perspective of who, Je who Jesus is, is not because we're taking words that appeared 600 years later. The idea of years is eliminated when the, when the Bible itself talks about issues and events and, and individuals that pre-existed thousands of years ago before the very inscriptions of those uh, revelations and writings. But after that one, I alhamdulillah rabbil Thank you. The debaters will have four rounds of two minutes each. They are able to say, uh, they are able to ask a question or to say something that they wanted to say earlier. They didn't get in. Pretty much whatever they want to do in their two minutes. So we will have four rounds, two minutes, uh, starting with Nabil. Now, I think uh, there is a saying, I don't remember it right now, but it goes something along the lines of, uh, if it's your friend who's criticizing you, uh, then it's able to be believed. Uh, you, should, you should take your friend's criticism to heart. Um, and with that in mind, uh, I, I'm going to have to blast you on this front. Um, you have said, who is Jesus? The debate, who is Jesus, cannot be had. Much rather, we should be talking about what does the Quran say versus what the Bible says. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, what Frahan is proclaiming at this point is that there is no way we can know, evidentially speaking, who Jesus was. It's your book over my book. We can't actually look into the history. We can't actually know from evidence who Jesus was. You trust your book, I trust my book. Frahan has essentially said, I am a Muslim, therefore I have my view of Jesus. I first and foremost believe in the Quran. I first and foremost believe Muhammad. Who cares what the evidence says? In fact, there can be none. Uh, I only believe in Jesus because I've already concluded about Islam. I conclude it's true. Therefore, who Jesus is is told to me by the Quran. Uh, I posit before you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a historical man named Jesus. That historical man lived in first century Jerusalem. We have records regarding his life. In fact, we have more records regarding his life than we have of the Roman emperor of his time, Tiberius. So much so that we know facts about him that are so incontrovertible, these are the greatest facts of history. Beyond that, we have statements from him that are found in so many sources that are so similar, that refer back to statements from the Old Testament, that refer to statements from contemporary times, that are so powerful, we can know what he says. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have a historical perspective, a historical event, it can be investigated by history. And the only reason someone would deny this is if history stands entirely against him. Thank you, Nabila. The history which he speaks of is definitely a historical perspective, but whether it is an accurate perspective, whether it is truth from God, is, not, is something that, that is a different issue altogether. Anyone can have a historical perspective 4,000 years ago. People can have a historical perspective from, in reference to Buddha or Krishna or any individual, but whether their perspective pertaining to that individual, their claims, their, their being, uh, whether those perspectives is truth from God is again an entirely different issue. In, in the end, it's an issue of my book versus your book pertaining to this individual. 
primarily because Paul, even himself, never saw the life and times of Jesus. So how can this be history when Paul himself did not see Jesus, see the life and times of Jesus? You believe in Paul because he claimed that he had certain visions. You believe in Paul and the assertions that he gives about Jesus because of these visions and because of evidences that you apparently see about this individual who is claiming things about a man who he did never, who, who he never saw. Instead, he went and learned from individuals who, who, who knew him, and he, he, had, he, had, he learned from Jews, and he, he, he had communication with Gentiles. It is a historical perspective from an individual who never met Jesus, and that's all that it is. And I can respect it being a historical perspective, but it doesn't mean that it is definitely the untainted truth from God. I was trying to be respectful and not have to do this, um, but he has said, it's your book versus my book. Uh, we had that debate yesterday. We had the debate on the Quran yesterday. And he says, it's, you're taking your book and I'm taking my book and that's that. Well, then let's look at your book for a second. What happened here? As I said, initially, when, uh, when Muhammad received the revelation from the Quran the first time, he didn't know who was giving it. Was it a demon? Was he possessed by his poet spirit? Or was he actually receiving revelation from God? In fact, he didn't think he was receiving revelation from God until his wife told him so. After that happened, this book that came, the Quran, would constantly be receiving updates. It's, forget those verses I revealed earlier, you have new verses. So the eternal word of God is constantly changing according to Islamic history. Not only that, you have different modes of revelation of this book. Seven different ways of, of uh, revelation for one book. So if in any case you have seven different types of words in one verse, all of them are from God. Uh, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but this is what we're told to believe about the Quran. After that, um, the Quran had never ever been collected during the time of Muhammad himself. It wasn't collected until 23 years later. And what happened when they collected the Quran? The people who were chosen by Muhammad to teach the Quran said this book is a deception. Ubay ibn Qab, one of the other teachers, says that this book doesn't even have all the chapters it's supposed to have. One of the leaders of Islam says this book is missing verses that should be in it. The wife of Muhammad himself said verses are missing from the Quran because a goat ate it. So the problems you have with the Quran are so astounding. Now let's look at the New Testament. Why do I believe the New Testament when it comes to Jesus? One, you have testimony from John, a disciple of Jesus himself. Two, you have this, uh, testimony from Mark, the secretary of Peter. Three, you have testimony from Luke, the man who was there to, to go and see uh, from himself, from the eyewitnesses, what happened. Four, you have testimony from Matthew, a disciple himself. During the lives of the disciples, all these books were written. So if at any point anyone disagreed with uh, what these books said, they could have gone to the disciples or the people who saw Jesus and said, what was Jesus actually like? You tell, them, you tell us with your own eyes. However, when it comes to the Quran, a book um, who cannot be defended very well, a book that has a, poor shoddy, a very shoddy history. Time. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. <laughs> Two minutes. What essentially Nabil did was he gave in. He agreed that it's, a, that it's a debate between the Quran and the Bible. And I can sit here and talk about manuscript variants about the, concerning the Bible, why certain uh, uh, Bibles have verses that, that are not included or are eliminated from other versions of the Bible, and so on and so forth. This debate can be had, but as long as you give in to the notion and, and, and to the understanding that we Muslims believe in what we believe in, in the Quran as the word and speech of God, and we will always take that over what is what you and I agree is the historical perspective and interpretation and words of men. Although you may essentially believe that it is inspired uh, by God, you still believe that these are the words written according to the minds and limitations. Uh, of certain individuals, just like Luke said in his uh, in in, in, uh, in his first chapter, that many have written narratives, and I want to write one too. That's what Luke said. And essentially, what you did is give in. You gave in to the to to the idea that yes, it is a debate between the Quran versus versus the Bible. But I'm not going to sit here and debate the Quran and the Bible in the New Testament with with five minute conclusions. Nor is that nor is what this what this debate is about. What I said is that Muslims and Christians cannot debate the, 
the, the, the topic, who is Jesus? Because the Christian inevitably wants the Muslim to dive into the New Testament and debate with him a book that he does not believe in in the first place. And that is an unfair, uh, that is an unfair, um, um, uh, um, that is an unfair lead that, that, that he's trying to give, try, trying to put me in. So, uh, I, hopefully with that I have proven my point that it is essentially a debate between the Quran and the Bible. And after that one, I'm going to do that. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Two minutes. Um, I'm not giving in. I have provided an argument from every single historical perspective possible. On top of that, I have provided this argument as well. If you're going to blind your eyes to the historical evidence and say, this is only a debate based on books, I would say, cool, your book is still not as trustworthy as my book. So on top of all the reasons, on top of all the evidence, when you turn to your book and say, I, I, you know, we just can't debate this debate. I have to say, why did you agree to this topic then? But then beyond that, uh, if you're trusting your book, I'd have to say, why are you trusting your book when this book is so much more trustworthy? But you're right, that's a different topic for a different day. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, if that were the topic today, it would still be in my favor. Um, and then you say, okay, so the New Testament is inspired, but those weren't God's words. Well, what do you think inspired means? Like, I'm, I'm really curious as to what you think we mean when we say the Bible is inspired. I'm telling you, it means that the God-sanctioned truth is there. We can turn to the Bible and say, God told us this, God told us X, and that's the whole point of inspiration. To that degree, the Quran and the Bible are believed by their own adherents to be the word of God. That is what matters. Anything else about the hard inspiration, words versus not quite the same word, whatever you're saying about the inspiration, the degree of the uh, actual wording, doesn't matter. When we say inspire, we mean God-given truth, and both sides believe that equally. And finally, Farhan's been quoting over and over again, uh, I do not believe your book. I do not believe your book. Uh, what, what do you mean you don't believe my book? The only thing you need to believe about the New Testament in order for my, uh, in my debate arguments to work is that the Gospels and the books in the New Testament are early books. That's it. You don't need to believe that they're God-inspired. You don't need to believe that they're inerrant. You just have to believe that they're first century documents. At that point, if you agree with that, and virtually every single scholar in the world agrees that the New Testament documents are the earliest manuscripts about Christian history, once you agree with that, my arguments work. I don't need you to quote-unquote believe anything else about it. Um, so I, I really am wondering what you think we mean when we say inspiration. The question isn't about what, what do you mean about inspiration. The question is how do Muslims view their book and how do Christians view their book. The Christian may essentially believe that this represents the truth from God, but they will also admit that these are the words from the minds of men. That when they wrote down what they wrote down, this wasn't some type of verbatim revelation, some unwritten tr heavenly truth being dictated by, by, by the divine or, 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 or an angel, as in the case of what Muslims believe pertaining to the Qur'an. It is still essentially, as Luke himself says in the very first chapter, a narrative according to him. Now, if you believe that this was an inspiration of God and that ultimately this represents the truth of God, I give you that right. The fact that this is a historical perspective, I give you that right. This is very much so a historical perspective, and I can appreciate that. But what I'm saying is that essentially it will always come down to the issue of is the Qur'an the truth from God? And therefore you are willing to come up here and give a lot of different points about the Qur'an. And I can give a lot of different points about the New Testament. But that is not what this debate is about. My point is that when David sent me to these topics, who is Muhammad and who is Jesus, these were the, t the debate to topics that we were given. And in order to explain to the Christian public uh, and to the Christian listeners that this is the Muslim perspective pertaining to this issue, I have, gi I I have given my presentation. Last two minutes. I submit before you again, the only thing that matters about the degree of inspiration is whether or not, in the end of the day, we have the Word of God. Christians believe we have the Word of God. Muslims believe they have the Word of God. To that degree, we are entirely on the same ground, and your um, argument that we are not simply is invalid. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, 
Farhan has agreed that the Islamic view of Jesus is unhistorical. It has no basis in history. It has no basis, therefore, in any sort of truth we can verify. The only reason you would ever believe that about Jesus is if you first believe that Muhammad is a prophet and that the Quran is a book from God. And I will tell you, I used to believe that once upon a time. I used to believe that the Quran was a book from God and that Muhammad was a prophet. But then when I noticed that this man was wrong about every single thing he said happened in history, it started to boggle my mind. He's wrong about Moses. He's wrong about Mary. He's wrong about Jesus. He's wrong about Isaac uh, and Ishmael. He's wrong about so many different historical things that I cannot trust his book. I cannot trust his prophethood. So when, when it comes to Am I going to trust the Qur'an on the issue of Jesus? Well, you have a lot of reasons to not trust the Qur'an on the issue of Jesus. Again, I'm not giving in to the fact that that's the, all there is to this debate. This is a very historical debate on a very historical question. My opponent, however, has admitted that Islam has no ground, historically speaking. It is not verifiable in this regards. I will posit to you, however, that he is wrong even in that. It is non-verifiable. You, uh, you can show that it is not true. All you have to do is open up the pages of history, turn to the first century in Jerusalem and see that the Bible over and over and over again is well defended in its beliefs. And over and over and over again what the Quran says about Jesus, giving life to clay of birds, speaking at birth, uh, saying his disciples were the uppermost and then later finding out that they weren't. All these things show that the Islamic view of Jesus is not the one that should be adhered to. The idea here is not to accept a historical perspective, especially from thousands of years ago that can only be verified according to the canon that, that it exists in. Even Christian denominations are undecided as a whole uh, about the nature of who and what God is and who and what Jesus is. And this is something, uh, something as core as who and what God is and who is what Jesus is cannot be even reconciled and agreed upon. By, by, by Christians, this is an issue. And the, 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 it, this isn't some type of passable doctrine or issue that can be disagreed upon or something that, is, that, that should be susceptible to interpretation. This is the very definition of who and what God is and who and what Jesus is. And I've said before that the Jews have had an interpretation and a definition of who and what God is for centuries. They never defined him as a triune being. They never defined... Uh, they never uh, predicted uh, that God would change his nature, rather that he is unchanging. And the fact of the matter is that I want to re-emphasize to you is that, th that, a his that this historical perspective violates the monotheism and the, and the logical definition of God. It violates it in the sense that it is a squared circle, in the sense that it is a finite yet infinite being, in the sense that this is a contradictory oxymoron type, type doctrine and belief. This is the Christian perspective and interpretation and definition of who and what God is according to their historical perspective. And I will agree with you that people believed in these things. People believe in many things. People have many different historical perspectives. But the idea here again is that this is not a debate that can be had without first establishing if the Quran is the word of God or whether the conjectures within the New Testament are, 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 are uh, worth believing in in the first place. Thank you. We will now have five-minute closing statements, starting with Nabil Qureshi. <laughs> well, this debate did not at all go the way I thought it would. Um, and I'd like to start off by praising Farhan. Uh, I'm sure you can all see why. He's a good friend of mine. Um, for one, he takes, out whatever I, he takes whatever I dish out with a smile, and uh, that's awesome. Uh, I do the same. However, uh, beyond that, he did many things that are very admirable in this debate. For one, he admitted that he did not know something uh, that was central to my, my point, Carmen Christie. That's something you don't normally see in debates, and I praise him for that. I also praise him for the fact that he went out on a limb and said that his view of Jesus is a completely unhistorical one. Uh, he actually admitted that the Islamic view of Jesus is not something you can get from history. 
This is something you don't generally see people admitting to. It's very true, and yet again, uh, I am right for saying Farhan uh, is, is, a, is a trustworthy and honest man. Finally, he said that his theological presuppositions stop him from believing that God can become a man. It's what he already believes about what God can do that stops him from seeing the truth about Christ. He admits this, uh, aside from the truth part, he admits this, that is his theological presuppositions that stop him from agreeing with us. Nothing historical, uh, nothing evidential, just his presuppositions. Uh, so for admitting these things, I think he is deserving of praise. What I want to point out at this point is what has happened in this debate. First, I started off by providing evidence that Jesus claimed to be God. I used the earliest source material we have. I showed how it's extremely well defended, and there's no doubt that Jesus claimed to be God according to these materials. Beyond that, we've seen that the earliest stratum of Christian history viewed Jesus as nothing else other than of the highest Christology, worthy of being worshipped as Yahweh and being given the characteristics of Yahweh. We saw that, without a doubt, none of that was even challenged. What was challenged was that the New Testament is providing an accurate picture and not something that's been influenced by Paul. I responded to that by showing that Paul was not influencing the disciples, but instead the disciples were influencing Paul. That is the only way we can explain Paul's reaction to the early Christians. Uh, Farhan has said, that's just a theory, Nabil. I say, yeah, it's a theory with evidence. Do you have a better theory, and what is your evidence? Uh, he has not provided a better theory, nor has he provided evidence for that non-existing theory. So we can see that Paul actually did respond to the early Christians as if they were claiming that Jesus was divine, and we see that this is found in the earliest stratum of Christian history. I would like to uh, conclude by saying this. When you have a historical event such as the life of Jesus, such as the claims of Jesus, such as the man of Jesus himself who walked in first century Jerusalem, who lived a life and died a death on the cross, and then was said to have risen from the dead. When you have a man in this historical context, you can open up the pages of history. You don't have to be indoctrinated. You don't have to be dogmatic about it. You do not have to be brainwashed by a book that was written hundreds of years later with very little reason to believe it. You can, in fact, investigate these things with your own mind that God has given you. And in fact, it will be that investigation that you do that you will be held accountable for at the end of time. So what happens? What happens when we open up the pages of history? We see that God became a man. That for our sake, for our sins, he decided to empty himself into the form of a bondservant, lowering himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. The God of this universe chose to become a man for our sake, for our sake to, to help us with our sins, to take them upon himself so that we could live in peace and eternity with him. That God is Jesus Christ. And we can either look at that God as found not only in history, not only in the Torah, not only in the Injil, um, but actually in the pages of history itself in verifiable fact. We can look that God in the eyes and say, I reject you, and I'd rather accept a book from hundreds of years later. Or you can say, God, it doesn't matter to me what I was told as a child. It doesn't matter to me the books I have read. It doesn't matter to me the things I have been told you come before everything, and I will accept you for who you are over all my presuppositions. That is what we will be faced with at the end of times. And if there are any of you who are here who have yet to face that question, I urge you, please, do the investigation. Understand, Jesus Christ came to this world to die for your sins and did die on the cross and then rose from the dead, proclaiming to be God. He is your Lord and Savior. It is through him that you were created. It is through him that you can be saved. Amen. Thank you. Now, when I took this debate and when I when I examined what, what I was going to say, I I and I emphasized and I said it in my opening statement that I was going to have to take this topic entirely from a logical perspective. Thus, I question whether. Christians are worshiping the flesh of Jesus or the, or the Spirit of God. This I, may, I question whether, whether God could be a squared circle and things of this nature. Philosophical questions about the problems within Christian doctrine and, within, and problems within the definition of who and what God is and the definition of who and what Jesus is according to the historical perspe perspectives 
uh, and conjectures within the New Testament, uh, within the New Testament writings. And oh, I, I had to do so by first and foremost admitting and saying that the, the New Testament is not a book that I believe in. I don't believe in the conjectures and interpretations of men, but I believe in something that claims to be the direct speech and word of God untainted by, man, by, by, uh, by any man's words or, 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 or conjectures or interpretations. And that is and what has been the Muslim perspective. If, if Christians and Jews can trust revelation, if they can trust revelation that speaks about individuals and events that occurred thousands of years ago, then that is all that we Muslims are doing as well. We're trusting revelation over the conjectures and interpretations of men. And this essentially means that one has to debate whether the Qur'an is the truth or if the New Testament as a being a historical perspective that is believed to be, have been inspired by the, by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, by God or whatever have you, whether, wh which of those two, two statements is actually true. And as I said, I can respect a historical perspective. But that's all that it really is, is a historical perspective. And yes, the Qur'an is not the historical perspective of any man. It is the truth, directly from the speech and revelation of God. Well, if we had uh, paid for tonight, I would say that we got our money's worth, don't you think? <laughs> what a great debate. Um, I want to give one more round of applause for both of our debaters. I also want to give you their websites one more time. Um, for Farhan, it's DefendingIslam.com. For David and Nabil, it would be Acts17.net. And for myself, it's ConfidentChristianity.com. And uh, I want to let, encourage you to continue the pursuit for truth that you have begun tonight. Uh, this pursuit of truth is the pursuit of the knowledge of God, the creator of all truth. There is no greater task than this. Thank you, Jackson Memorial Baptist Church, for hosting us again. And thank you to all of you for being here with us tonight. Uh, have a safe trip home, and God bless you.